the architect should elevate themselves, knowing the skills of gluing everyone together. Hello and welcome to the business of architecture. Have you ever had trouble finding an architectural photographer who could really make your project shine? Today's episode is sponsored by renowned architectural photographer, Tobin Davies. Tobin Davies eliminates the hassle by traveling to your location to create the stunning photographs your project deserves. And we are happy to support him here on the business of architecture podcast. Visit TobinDavies.com or BayawayPhotos.com to book a shoot in less than 10 minutes and ask about the special offer for Business of Architecture podcast listeners. Again, that's TobinDavies.com or BayawayPhotos.com. Hey, I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And today, it's an absolute privilege to converse with Paul Southhouse, who is a fellow architect, the pioneering force behind Paul Southhouse Architects. He was um, one of the Business of Architecture smart practice clients, so I know him very, very well. We had the privilege of working with Paul for about a period of 12 months where they really kind of made an enormous effort to uh, change things in their in their businesses. They were already a, a very high performing business and they really took it to the next level. They're based in the historic and beautiful city of Oxford where where this interview was filmed. So I had a little day off and uh, trundled down to Oxford and Paul gave me a tour around the beautiful university grounds and all the medieval Gothic delights that exist there. And his firm has really carved a niche in Oxford, conceptualizing and executing housing developments and modern residences across the southeast of England. And they really, their work embodies a blend of innovation and tradition. But what's also very interesting is that Paul, being the pioneering force that he is, they have also implemented and opened up two other separate businesses not most commonly associated with architectural practice. So one is Lynn Race, Lynn Race Spirit, and the uh, which is essentially a hospitality label. So he's the brains and co-owner of the hospitality label uh, Lynn Race, uh, which is situated also in the heart of Oxford's Jericho. And this brand is really fostering a rich culture of indulgence through its two distinguished venues. So the first one is Lynn Race Spirit, which is for connoisseurs and creators alike, um, where there's a, a splendid array of spirits and cocktails, which is where we actually filmed the interview and I indulged in a very nice non-alcoholic spirit and the other venue is Popina which is a more classical indulgence where one can savour nuances of fine wines, artisan cheeses and charcuterie. So both places absolutely beautiful, stunning, stunning interiors. I highly recommend to go down and, and have a look and in this conversation um, Paul and I discuss the, the kind of lessons learned from opening up this hospitality brand, how the hospitality brand has started to influence um, Paul Southhouse architects, how they've started to use it as a place to embed themselves into the community, how they can be facilitators and thought leaders of architectural conversation in Jericho. Um, it kind of anchors them into a commercial community as well of shop owners and business owners. Um, they've got this very prominent front-facing openness to uh, to Jericho now, to Oxford City, which makes it very, very um, interesting. And of course, the lessons learned from, you know, working in hospitality, uh, uh, I think are very, are very interesting. And one of the first things Paul starts to discuss is, you know, as an architect, when we're running an architect practice, we make the mistake of trying to do everything ourselves. One of the beauties of running a business where perhaps you're, you're, you know less about it is that very quickly you know that you need to bring in experts you know you need to bring in other people who can operate various sides of these businesses so again i've met and spoken with many architects or many design housing design firms for example who aren't helmed by an architect and they tend to be very successful because the entrepreneur at the top is very good at making sure that he puts people in place and this is one of the one of the main kind of um conversations that Paul and I explore. Anyway, it was brilliant. Um, Paul and his practice are very inspiring. 
um, do check out their work and sit back, relax and enjoy a rock and roll architecture practice with Paul Southhouse. Paul, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm very well, Ryan. Thank you for having me. Absolute what, pleasure. What an honour. Well, it, it's an absolute honour to be here in probably, I think, one of the coolest venues I've had the pleasure to do a podcast in my illustrious podcasting career. Um, we're actually in a bar which you own and have designed and and there's another one, a wine and charcuterie place up the road. That's we're actually right. underneath the uh, Paul Southhouse Architects office, which is above here, mm-hmm. of which you are the the uh, the premier of. Um, you've also been a client at Business of Architecture. That's right. Yeah, Tra- changed my life. Fant- fantastic. Glad for to the hear. better. Glad to hear. <laughs> um, so, absolute pleasure to have you on the on the show. And I guess the first question really is because there's a lot to talk about here. I mean, you're you know. The, what you've been doing at PSA has been, you know, amazing. You've got a, quite an incredible portfolio of work. A lot of stuff here in Oxford: housing, mixed use, mm-hmm. um, cultural buildings, civic buildings, um, and of course your other kind of entrepreneurial ventures here with Lynn Race. And I think that's a really kind of interesting topic as well of like how how an architect becomes a bar and wine. Yeah, no, for sure. And there's so many interesting takeaways from owning and running a bar. Well, why don't, why don't we start there? Why don't we, yeah. the, you know, the, 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 it was September last year that you opened up this, the Spirits Place. What was the thinking behind that? Well, after COVID, it was a case of there are a load of shops in town centres which are now empty, unfortunately. So there's an opportunity. And I always had this vision of, the architect elevating themselves and being in the in the thick of it, but having being front facing rather than you know trying to avoid paying rates and um, all those sorts of things and trying to find the cheapest space on the fringe, which is mm-hmm. which is cool because cool things happen on the fringe. Uh, but my instinct was post COVID that being in towns and in cities was the future, and that's where we needed to grow and get better. So it's just. Um, chucking myself in the thick of it that was the idea the building came with a shop front right knowing what we know about design you and in a being a sort of a high street location you want to be an active shop front i've seen a lot of offices in those locations they've become quite blank you don't know if you can go in you really want to go in there's some interesting models but even as an architect you don't go in yeah so i opened an off license originally um, selling bottled cocktails because that was another product from COVID. They didn't exist before. You could buy pre-made cocktails. Throughout COVID, I really learned that you know one of my other skills is making cocktails mm-hmm. and then connecting with all the the craft of spirits is just fascinating. So we opened an off license in April, twenty two, mm-hmm. and quickly it everyone who came in was like, "Wow, this is amazing! What an amazing space!" What are you? They didn't know what we were. And they were saying, well, it's clearly a bar, but no, we're not a bar, we're off license. And what are you selling? Well, that's a bit weird, it's a bottle of cocktails. What's that? So <laughs> I was kind of a, a bit ahead of, uh, I know I liked it, and uh, but no one else knew what I was on about. So as commercially, it was not successful. Mm-hmm. Uh, my son helped me, he's a 20 year old, he helped me run it and, and man it and, and all those sorts of things uh, in his sort of gap year. But so that kind of made sense because I could you know, give him some, some cash and we could live. He's living with me and it was all fine. But then it was a case, well, this isn't really working financially. <laughs> Why is that? So I did a, I started opening on a Friday and Saturday night on my own serving cocktails. And, you know, you, you'd finish a long week on a Friday and then you change or not change and become a bartender okay, so what would I get? Maybe 10 customers a night? But it was starting to generate something. And then one night, this this Colombian guy came in with some friends, um, some Mexican friends. They sat down, they were having a lovely time. And it turned out he was attending one of the colleges. He was a bit of an influencer. And he made a call. And all of a sudden, 30 people arrived. And I was on my own. It was like 30 people. It turned into a massive party. I was breaking all the laws to, to do with licensing and closing and everything. And it was that, that night I just thought, well, okay, this is really not a good idea. Yeah. Uh, I'm closing and I'm going to do it properly. So then it took around three or four months to, to re, 
you know, design the menus and things. And we opened in September. So, so was it a as a, a response to COVID, like just being cooped up on feeling like you you wanted to be part of revitalizing the the high street or what? What were some of the things so that were happening? So there's something deep within me that's always had this idea of people need to get together and they need a space to do that. So right. Lynn Race Spirit is about an informal space where you can meet people and chat and connect and create. Mm-hmm. Whereas you know, a lot of bars are very much focused on, you know, you're going for a date or it's, they're very commercial and they're just trying to get the money out of you and make sales. So with the architectural practice paying the rent, it didn't really matter what it did. It could just be about what I wanted mm-hmm. and which was just to connect people. And, and it does, it does that. You know, the space is, is amazing acoustically. You can be sat next to someone and you know they're there, but it's also very dark, so you can't see them. Mm-hmm. You know they're a blur in the background and also you can't hear them. And it's, it's really a, this beautiful, intimate space where you, you can see the whole room and what the bartender's doing, the, the theatre of the, you know, making the drinks. Mm-hmm. It's all part of it. So, and everyone, everyone loves it. So, so that, that's, the bar's been incredibly successful. So, so was it, was it a, a kind of idea where you wanted it to be a standalone business and a different a separate business venture to PSA or did you see it as being a way to drive work to PSA or an opportunity to be able to showcase some design skills and enter into the hospitality sector perhaps well when I think back it was purely there's a space to be used that needs to be active right is the right business for that what's missing okay I've got to drive to London to buy a bottle of mezcal (laughs) <laughs> and that's a real pain. If I've, the got, Mexico. <laughs> if I've got a bar, then I, th- there's no other bar in Oxford that caters what I need, so why not create the one I want? Yeah. Love Simple it. as that. That's how it started, uh, for sure. And then it's kind of moulded over time of, well, how actually can that be a marketing tool for the architectural practice mm-hmm. and how do those these work together? But more, I think the biggest impact has just been on how the practice functions and comparing the processes mm. because of whilst yeah, making a cocktail and doing some drawings are very different the processes are probably very similar um, in terms of getting the work doing the work well, and administering well, well, well this is interesting because I was, I was asking you earlier about what you know what are some of the lessons that you've learned from running an architect practice that have been appropriate for running the yeah. two the two bars and vice versa. What's, well, what what do you learn? The, the big the biggest one, which is really, really very simple, is as a customer, you go into a bar, you know you're going to a bar, and it's probably got some Google review, therefore you've got some indication of what you're going into. You've made a decision. You then look at a menu and you can see the price, and then you order that item on the menu. It gets made for you um, individually. You know, similar to creating a piece of architecture, it's a, it's a bespoke design for someone. Mm-hmm. It then gets delivered to you you know, on a tray, and then you, you drink it and have a merry time, and then it gets taken away and washed up and all those sorts of things. But, you know, ask for the bill, you pay your bill, and then the money comes out of your account as the customer, and the next day it goes into, into the company's account. And through that whole process, there's complete clarity of what someone's getting, what they're paying for it, and they've paid. There's an immediacy to it. It's arrived immediately. Now, you think about architecture, the the moment you draw a line, forgetting how you got to be drawing that line, it's probably eight weeks as a minimum (laughs) before you get any money from that. Um, Yeah, so that's the biggest thing is that expectation. But also, if if you're in a bar and someone says, oh, could, could I have another drink? You say, yes, that's £12, please. Mm-hmm. If someone in architecture says, oh, can I have another drawing? You say, oh, yeah, I'd love to do another drawing. You don't say, oh, that's going to be £1,000, <laughs> do you? Um, well, generally you don't. So, and there's a lot of lessons learned in that regard. And architects, could, yeah, just before you do the drawing, because we're so eager to please and love doing what we do, mm-hmm. And this is what comes from having a, a, some professional bartenders. It's like, well, I'm not making that if you're not paying for it. Yeah. Simple. It's the same deal. Yeah. No, there's, I, I, I think that's what's very interesting about kind of any kind of retail experience or hospitality experience. One, you know, you've created an environment which is very attractive for people to come into. Mm. There's a, 
a culture and the way that you're interacting with people, which is going to be part and parcel of the experience of yep. the of the drink. And then the drink has got some hard metrics to it in terms of, well, you've got to charge it a certain amount to cover your overheads. You've got to make some profit on the drink. You've got to pay for it. Oh, it's the- very, very precise how the drink's broken down and the GPs. That's another term I learned, gross profit. You know, right. You've got to know your GPs. So that's, that's what everyone talks about. Well, and this is interesting. Because when people working in the, in a restaurant or the culinary trades, they tend to be, you know, they're putting on live events. They get very mm. focused. And even at a very early level, anyone running that kind of business knows their numbers in terms of what they've got to shift, how much yeah. it's going to cost, how much they're going to be paying for team members. Whereas in architecture, we tend to, we can get away with not doing any of that. We know that that's not great from, you know, from what we've been talking about, business architecture yeah. for long enough. Um, what was what were some of the things that that actually became real lessons in the business that you started to change or? Well, to, responding to the time at the moment is I think the idea of putting together an architectural fee proposal for a full service based on a percentage or a large fat number doesn't work. People do, they want to know an itemized list of what that is. So our recording, you know, obviously everyone's recording their time, mm. but it's, it's actually then. It's not just time that's being recorded, it's what the activity is. So I'd say everything we do now is we are recording every project activity as well as time. So then when it, if someone does want something extra, we can note it and mark it and it, it does get paid for. For sure, also tightening up the menu, you know, the, the original scope of service, mm-hmm. being extraordinarily precise about what is included and what is excluded. And as soon as there's a client-derived change after x you know after tender then okay well we'll note down our hours and activity what we were doing okay well you want motorized roof lights well we, we already specified the roof lights yeah you want motorized ones we could go through all the drawings and change that add it to the spec okay it's taken four hours it's noted down and they pay for it so it's exactly like the mm. I mean, it seems really obvious but there's so much that we in the what I did as an architect beforehand, someone said, oh, let's have some motorized roof lights. Okay, no problem, I'll change the drawings. You don't realize how much time you just spent doing that. But now it's all kind of recorded and it's paid for. Yeah. And that is a direct result of what I've learned from running bars. It's that, so, that's that's so interesting. And the other thing as well is that your both the bars here, they're very specific. So there's mm. a very clear theme as you Absolutely. go into each one. And even the fact that there's two separate spaces, one for spirits and one for wine and yeah. charcuterie, which yeah. is, which is again, that in itself is not, you know, there's plenty of bars that don't do that and would be more what we'd call like a generalist bar, if yeah. you like, which would be much more difficult to market. Well, even though, well, so pubs now serve cocktails and right. they're, yeah, you, oh, and they have coffee as well. So you go to a pub and have a cocktail. But when you go to a pub, you want a beer, it's about, serving quickly, getting through people. The bartender's stuck there making a cocktail, which takes time. Right. Um, it, it then it, it undermines what a pub is. Mm-hmm. So absolutely, it's being ultra clear and specific about what we serve. And there's no real blending either. Although if you're in the wine bar and you are you do come to the, the spirit and cocktail bar and you really want a, an old-fashioned with a particular whiskey, we mm-hmm. will make it and deliver it across the road, no problem. Right, right, okay, so people yeah. do get there. Yeah. They can get there. No, I, I do, you know, I've had people sit at the bar because I, I do enjoy being on the shifts and, and talking to people. Uh, you know, if someone wants a cup of tea, I'll make them a cup of tea. So yeah. I'll go to the office and make it. So, so in, in terms of, like, getting the bar set up, you know, what were the, who were the key personnel that you had to put into place? I mean, and, and we know that in an architecture practice, what's quite interesting is, People run an, start an architecture business and then do everything themselves. Yeah. And here you've got a situation where if you try to do that, then and you know you're already running another business. Well, look what look what happened. I, I was running a Friday and Saturday night as the owner and the bartender, and it was a total disaster. I lost control completely. Yeah. And it was an immediate. Oh, I'm, I'm closing. It was you know so. No, as soon as I had. You just start giving away free drinks because it's easier to... I've got, I don't even know what happened. It just was a huge party. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, no, having a, a solid team who deliver the product is essential. I'm not part of that in any way. Mm-hmm. And that's another fascinating takeaway is, as an architect, you're almost expected to do the production. Mm-hmm. 
but in the bar world I'm actively told not to do it because I just make a mess and cause confusion so yeah why on earth architects uh, try and run their own practices I, I don't know they should either have someone who manages them yeah and they're the, they're just a worker or they just are the owner and get everyone else to do it. well I mean this is why we, there's no shortage of entrepreneurs who have entered into the architectural space with no architectural skill sets whatsoever but have come with a business mindset mm. and then have created very profitable businesses and yeah. they've hired you know they hire lots of architects who do the work for them whereas the architect will often either get trapped in you know there's, there's a comfort obviously because you're an architect that's what I know how to do and then if I put the energy into doing that then surely that means it will be better yeah but it doesn't always and so of... so what what is, you learn a lot I learned I am an architect so that is what I am mm -hmm. and I, I adore doing it. I don't wake up thinking about what I'm going to be billing I just yeah. just really happy to do what I'm doing so there's a realization of that's what I am I'm not a business well, I am the business owner of the practice but I'm not necessarily the best person to do the marketing or the admin mm -hmm. but I, I sh and I've come it's taken a while to get to that realization probably well, several several years or decades even but so now I have I'm now solidly in production because that's what I enjoy I love doing the drawings mm -hmm. there is a, a percentage probably 25% is getting the work right and then there's a there's a, a marketing manager dealing with all of that side and, and there's, there's still a lot of work to do in improving those things, but then the, then the admin is delegating all of that activity mm -hmm. away because it doesn't earn any money either, the, yeah. the admin side. But it's critical. You're complying with everything you need to comply with. Yeah. So how, how, is your, how is PSA structured? How many people have you got working in the team? And, you know, and in that 25% of your time winning work, what are the sort of activities that you do to... To bring in well, the this work. links to how many hours you work, doesn't it? This is really tricky. So most people work forty hours a week. I probably work a few more than that, right? And then work the bars on top of that. So it, it's a it's a changing it's a changing model, I guess. But at the moment we're seven. Mm -hmm. I'm have to make a, a recent decision to reduce that slightly due to changes in our workload and uncertainty mm -hmm. around planning. Uh, and you, you know the, we're just not getting the projects through the pipeline. Everything is stuck in planning for eons. It's yeah. very very tricky at the moment. I think the key key to for me is someone who is organised and is more a, a practice manager, but also an architect. Uh, and they the glue that sticks everything together. I just make mess, and someone else is there to to sort of tidy it up in a sense or we'll pull it into a a nice order mm -hmm. um, so you know if you get into specifics it's like design statements you know I used to think I could write a wonderful design statement but now I, I know there's someone else who can do that better than me it will look better it'll be tidier or read better it will take longer yeah but, and so it should do but I can provide all the bits components to go in it mm -hmm. um, yeah so when, when did when did PSA start how long have you guys been so 2016. 2016, okay. And and when you first started up, what was the kind of impetus behind it? Did you have work previously lined up or was it as a reaction to something else? What was the what was the, the sort of so starting I, blocks? I tried to go into business with a good friend and we the idea is we'd have a London practice and Oxford practice. Right. And that we you know, we'd take over the world and make the world a better place in that way. But I think we were naive and didn't have the correct agreements in place. Then for money got in the way. Um, we just agreed to not do that anymore because foremost we're friends. Mm. Business second. And so I just set up out of that. Started in the garage and somehow managed to get people to come and work in a garage and <laughs> even drive from London and work in a garage, which was great. And... And then we, yeah, we built a studio, and that was built from there. I uh, built a studio in my garden. Right. Um, that was great. Again, I suppose even building the studio is similar to the bars. I'm trying to carve my own space where there's no client or planning system. You know, you're circumnavigating all the rules. Just being independent. Exactly, yeah. And, and uh, what were the first kind of projects that you brought into the, the business? And, and, w and what kind of strategy or structure have you pursued in, in kind of growing? So, 
in the early days, it's always existing clients. It's always the network with, that I have. All work has come from my own network. Right. I've now discovered, you know, you need a big network if you've got lots of staff, and that's that's a challenge in itself, making sure you're getting out there. But it's very much... Um, it's repeat work, repeat clients, and it's doing not necessarily what we want to be doing, but mm-hmm. it's we're getting what we're given in a sense. And it's only recently I've understood my own value in and actually being able to say no to someone. Mm-hmm. No, no, we're not doing that job, or we are. We will do it, but it's double what you want to pay. Mm-hmm. Therefore, there's another benefit. And yeah, no, we've lost. You know, for the first time, we have lost work because of we're not prepared to to do that. We want to be doing something else we Great. want to carve out what we're doing yeah um, standing your standing your ground in terms no, exactly. of like you know you, you know it's not going to be a fit if they're not willing to pay you what you want to be paid and if it's not a fit yeah. in terms of values and no we could we could lower the fees we, mm-hmm. and we could make it work and try and be more efficient but the reality is will we be proud of that work that we've done it's not going to be to the quality because we're rushing it mm-hmm. um, so no it, it's, it's, it's not a fit simple mm-hmm. isn't it yeah. And what for you, what are the sorts of things that make a project not a fit? I guess it's, well, so I focus on homes and housing. I love the, I just, I, it, I really struggle with the fact that the way everything's set up at the moment, uh, well, the value of a home is, is linked to the whole economy and everyone's borrowing money from homes to make it all work. And there's, there's a lot of people who can't afford to buy a home or they're so so ridiculously expensive now. And then they're working really hard and earning money and they just can't use it to their best advantage. So I'd love to be able to solve that. So, But first of all, if, if, I, if, I get, if I'm an expert in gaining planning consent and building homes for developers, then mm-hmm. I can then shift that to then apply to a building. And I wouldn't say it's affordable home, it's just, it's low cost housing or some form of entry level housing. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. 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 And, and well, so, so those, those are the kind of projects that you're doing mm. now, but in terms of like when you say no to a client, what is, okay. what do they need to, what are, what are the red flags for you? Well, okay. So is, is the outcome, are we going to be proud of it? Are we ready? Are we, do we want to put that, does it fit within what we're now doing? Does it even fit with the, the Lynn Race aesthetic? Mm-hmm. And, and PSA is going to mould to take on the Lynn Race, or we look through the Lynn Race lens. So what you see here in this space is more of the style at which we will approach things in the future. So are we going to be proud of it? If Okay, well, if we're not going to be proud of it, are we going to get paid handsomely for it, for mm-hmm. our time and expertise? So if we're not going to... So the red flag is if the fee's too low, you're not valued for yep. what you're doing. And if the client wants too much input, really, it, in terms of them moulding or changing the outcome, because they're, if, they're, if they're investing in you, they want whatever you're giving. Well, they, well this, this is interesting, this is, um, like how you structure this kind of relationship with, with clients, right? Mm. And there's one kind of approach where you become totally subservient to the client or you're doing everything that they want you to do and then now for many architects that's just not a fulfilling thing to be doing and also it's not actually that profitable because now you're just a tool Mm. and the client doesn't value anything because they are because they literally will come and they say well here's what we want you need you just do the drawings yeah no for sure and then it's kind of like well you know why are you even hiring why are you even hiring architect and then there's the balance you know the, the the skill, if you like, of being able to be more directive with the client to lead them down a journey of perhaps you know they might be they might have to invest more money more more money into the project more money into what you know your services how do you how do you balance that and what what kind of skills do you employ to so have that, that happen? I think there's been a big shift actually in you, that you talk about money because people are investing money in their property so yeah. whilst I say it's terrible there's all this money and the economy is linked to values. The other side is that people see it as a vehicle, and we're increasingly getting um, some of the smaller projects, of, or even the larger ones. It's like, well, if I spend this much, I'm going to live in it for 10 years, I enjoy it, I'm investing and paying that off, and then I've got the capital increase in that in the future. So 
it's also justifying people investing in their homes. Yeah. But then, yeah, then it's just, I guess it's all fueling the same thing. Um, I don't know, whilst you were talking, it just made me thinking about the role of the architect mm -hmm. and how an architect is able to navigate between a bricklayer who wants some information is probably swearing a lot about <laughs> the architect's <laughs> drawings and probably not following them and just swearing at them anyway. And then you're dealing with the high-end client who wants to quite, they're very, they can make a decision, they know what they want in a sense. And then everyone in between, all the consultants, the planet, and how, yeah, that, that's, that, that's a skill that an architect doesn't necessarily feel they have. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's linked to the bars is that all of a sudden those transferable skills go out into the community, I guess, because I'm now, now I'm a business owner with a front face. Mm -hmm people come to me or I go to them and are involved in helping the area with its signage, for example, and then we can really get put together a presentation or, or, or all those things. So there's just something about understanding value, which mm -hmm. has come out through owning and running the bars as not just being the practice that some people engage with. Yeah. So in, in that, again, that's, that's interesting in like the, the role of the architect being someone who needs to be able to negotiate and navigate a large group of people. And usually the architectural training is very kind of, you know, you, you spend seven years at university, mm. you're doing a project which has no interaction with any other human beings at all except for your tutor, really. Yeah. You know, you speculate about what, how people might behave and you spend, spend a lot of time speculating how things are going to, how things might happen. And then as soon as you come into the real world of doing architecture, you are being pulled in all of these different directions and it can be, you know, for a lot of people, it's just kind of either you collapse and you're just kind of, here you go, I'll just do what you need to do or find a way to be able to choreograph it all and mm. do it and do it well. And I can imagine, you know, being here in the, in the bar that there's, again, there's that more of that, there's more immediacy with, well, it is with, with people. No, it's, you know, someone's waiting an extra minute. They, you know, they're waiting an extra minute and therefore... It's the same that, that choreography, that that performance is it, it's all a performance, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's Did, fascinating. Have you have you used the bars to, you know, invite planners in, for example, or or clients or developers, and and had like round table talks, or you know, even invite other types of clients where they come in, they have some wine, drinks, and then you can have a kind of informal strategic yeah. conversation about something. Well, the first thing is, I'll, I'll say both bars have non-alcoholic varieties and we sell an awful lot of non-alcoholic drinks so it's not just about alcohol and, and drinking and getting as drunk. we're enjoying right here yeah it's, these are non-alcoholic drinks um so they it doesn't alcohol fueling everything um that's, that's for sure <laughs> that, that's not necessarily a bad thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah well the, over, over at popino which is the the wine bar it's um you know that expression in vino veritas so uh, it, so in, in wine, there is the truth. truth. <laughs> and there's a lovely idea that if you're drunk and you make a decision, review that decision when you're sober. Mm -hmm. Equally, if you make a decision when you're sober, make Have sure you get drunk and then review <laughs> that decision. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so no, we have we have an, a number of client meetings. Um, it's in terms of the marketing, it, you know, if you've got a practice, you say, oh, do you want to come for a coffee? You invite someone or a new client, do you want to come for a coffee? Where do you meet? It's quite novel or, or unique or special. Well, I'm not saying novel because mm -hmm. novel wears out. It's special to be able to invite someone for a drink in your venue. And it, it's an immediate conversation starter. Yeah. As well as that, we're able to, we also make our own cocktails and bottle cocktails. Mm -hmm. So I, we can make a cocktail in a bag and deliver it. So for example, I can go and, I, I'll go and just, arrive at someone's it's like a salesman isn't it you arrive at someone's office that you want to be working with or potential client and you say oh, i'm just delivering this cocktail telling you about what we're doing and then uh, oh, i'll come in and have a cup of tea i'll have a cake and you're sat there for two hours yeah creating that relationship so it it's a it's a great i don't know how you else you do it otherwise you just turn up and say i'm an architect from down the road and i fancy having a chat 
it's just not going to go anywhere, yeah. is it? So it's a, it's a great Well, I, I guess the other thing here, and, and when, I've, when I've interviewed other practices who have done similar sorts of things with like restaurants that attach their practices, mm -hmm. you're now really present and part of the community oh, in, sure. in a very different way as just an architect practice. Because you could, as an architect practice, stay you know, upstairs with a tiny little plaque on the window. No one yeah. knows you, you're there and, you know, you're, you're impacting the city and the area you live in, but no one really knows about you. Yeah. Whereas here now you're part of a very different community. You're front facing, people are walking past, you're, you know, you're actually part of the, the fabric of no, it. No, for sure. And that's a really, really important. That's the whole, the, the architect should elevate themselves knowing the skills of gluing everyone together. Yeah. Uh, be accountable and and get out there and and be part of the, the everything that's happening um, for sure. And that every business along this street is is like that. You know, they're very front facing, and mm -hmm. everyone knows they are. So then that that builds your own little business community there, and then you have an influence on what's happening in the area, uh, which which is also fascinating. But then I, I went further as well and then created uh, social events on as as well separate to both businesses again we're trying to bring the creative community together because there's, right. there's not a focus on that and then that then that's connecting people so you have this obsession with connecting people basically so tell me a little <laughs> bit about the, the where we are now because we're in jericho this very yeah. beautiful part of of oxford and i know that's a very important part for for you and actually being and you've done a lot of work here just across the road is one yeah. of your one of your projects, which has got, how many units did you say that had? 17. 17, 17 units, so quite significant bits of, of, of work. Mm. Um, what, is, what does Jericho mean to you as a, as a business? And is it somewhere, is it a, an area where you focus a lot of energy into like winning work and becoming the architect of the town or? No, I think Jericho is just a lovely place to be. It's built to human scale, which is a term I borrowed from Philip Pullman. It, it's not that old, Jericho. It's a, a sort of a city centre suburb of, of Oxford. Oxford is it's, it's controlled by the colleges. There, yeah. There's no private space and it's all very beautiful. And uh, either stone buildings, which you can't get into, or it's shops, which you don't want to go to. So just a stone's throw away from that is Jericho. Oh, it's independent businesses. Uh, I think it's it's... It arrived with the Oxford University Press and the canal, which brought coal to print books. Right. And then from that, the gridded pattern of little terraced houses, which is Jericho, is that, you know, they were the workers that worked for the press and then the press of them becomes digital and all these sorts of things that's sold. And then you've got an amazing uh, bunch of people, basically, mm -hmm. who are really quite active, very creative and then love engaging with the independent businesses here. So in terms of focusing work here, so I, I'm really lucky to work with one of the largest landlords of the city. And that's a relationship I've had for you know, two decades. Mm -hmm. they, much of their housing stock is in Jericho because they, they had now an foundry here. Uh, but it's at the same time, you've got to be careful of what you do we'd rather work outside of Jericho you know have an influence on what happens here and help others mm -hmm. so for example the, the wine bar was an accident it wasn't there was no intent this when I woke up on the 1st of January 2023 to open a wine bar I just went over to, it was the Jericho, called the Jericho Grill I went across and had dinner because no one ever went there so I thought let's just go there so I went had dinner and, uh, and it, the food was great but it just, there was something wrong with the atmosphere, the lighting, the, I want to say something wrong, it just wasn't, it wasn't Jericho, it wasn't good enough. Yeah. So I had a meeting with the owner in, in spirit and I was very impeccable in my approach and I was not, you know, made sure I was being, not putting him down or saying sure. something nasty. I was saying, look, this could be better, you know, we, we could, we can really help you. So, okay, well, and he let me talk and talk and talk. He said, well, he said, well, well, I'm, Unfortunately, it's not a really a financial success. So I'm, I'm closing next week. And I said, okay, well, you could have told me that. <laughs> <laughs> you could have told me that when we started. And then it, I, was, I was then with my bar manager. It turned into, okay, well, there's an opportunity here. What, what, does, what could this be? What could this space be? What could we do? Yeah. 
And then all of a sudden we're then in business with him and turned it around in, in weeks really. And created an amazing wine bar. Which so, so that that's really interesting because it's again it's the, it's the same kind of premise for here where you've identified this is what the space needs to be mm. for the area and that's a really architectural proposition it's also a very entrepreneurial one where you're finding something it's got a problem and here's a solution for it here's how it can how it, how it can be turned into something that can make some money and also be an asset to the area mm. and you know. and, and not require planning consent and get <laughs> stuck in the system for a year. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so this idea of kind of identifying spaces and then proposing a usage for them. I mean, you've done it. You've actually put, you put your own money into it and yeah. said, I'm going to make it work. Have you done that as a strategy with other investors or developers? That's an interesting idea. I've thought about it more in a charitable way. Right. For example... There's a whole load of buildings near the station, the train station, which are non-used. They're not going to be used for the next three years because one of the colleges bought them all and they're redeveloping it. They don't know what to do. So I've, I'm forming or trying to form a link with the university saying, well, how can we can we use these spaces for three years? You know, get some, in a sense, custodians of the space so they're looked after, but why can't there be some artist studios because they're crying for space? And... Uh, Every month, as I said, we meet as a, a group of creatives and it's various different arts, visual arts, and and that everyone is, they just want, they need some space. There's no space in the city, that sort of studio space, which is why we have an artist in residence in the basement because he didn't have a studio, uh, really wanted it, and it's, it's changed his life having a, mm. a space to work from. And and it's actually improved his health as well. So, um, But I thought your idea there of, approaching developers of here's this what can we do i guess that is happening because in a sense with the completion of st paul's house which is a building opposite the 17 flats we were able to then well one thing we did is we were able to they're a registered social landlord called ox place because we have a wine bar we said well do you want to come for a drink which have your building tour of this finished building that's immediately you're then talking yeah and then we're still on the rooftop, and they said, "Oh, we own, we own that little bit down there, don't we?" They said, yeah. So, well, how can we make that better? Is there a feasibility study to go on? So you're right. From that, we've started to create or work on feasibility studies for things that no one's even thought of. Right. You are right. Yeah. So you say actually, you're actually, yeah, starting to kind of create your own opportunities. No, no, or, for sure. Or, or facilitate them. Yeah. Very cool. Very, yeah. very interesting. It's, yeah, but it's, it's it's so linked. You've got to be embedded in the place to do that. I think. Yeah. Well, you, you, the other thing you were saying is, you know, you, you've found planning really difficult over the last, I mean, this is something, you know, uh, you know over COVID, what we were hearing, what's happening in planning, you know, the, the delays that were going on and it's fine during, it's, and fine, it's fine during COVID, it's the post-COVID. Right. I'm not sure if much, if the planning authorities and their consultees are even back in their offices or whether they still work from home, but um, I just can't. It's, it's like you ask for someone's comment mm -hmm. on something and they invariably comment. You provide the additional information, you send it back to them and then they have more comments. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then you, you provide that information. You've got nine consultants you're trying to coordinate this information with. Yeah, huge cost. Is, is, it, is, then, it, my is, is it a, a failure of kind of being under-resourced in the planning departments or is it this particular area in Oxford where everything's kind of, I have this image that everything's medieval and historic and you're always next door to... I know. think it's a lack of connection, right. personal connection between people. As soon as you get in a room, mm -hmm. you can swap these things out. And even getting a meeting in a room with the planners now is very difficult. It's going to be on Zoom. And since you're on Zoom, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to negotiate anything. Yeah. Um, if, yeah. If, so the building opposite, again, they, the planners were going to refuse that. And I, I said, no, let's get in a room and meet. And fortunately, in the period, somewhere between all the COVID things, and we were able to meet in a room and people were still think still of the mind we need to meet in person. Mm -hmm. And I was able to sit with the conservation officer and sketch stuff out with them. And we agreed a way forward. Mm -hmm. I came out of that meeting with a, a really clear direction, worked on it, sent it back. And she said, oh, that's great. Yeah, put that in, we'll approve it. But now it's like, put it in, bat it back, put it in, bat it back. It's this 
on never ending game of yeah, tennis. Yeah, and it's always, it's always kind of formalised as well, and it has to go through its place. Oh, do, another 21 days. Do, do, you ever, do you ever think we'll, we'll see the parts of the planning department privatised? Would that be a good idea? Well, they're already employing many private practices, aren't they, to, to offload and or outsource. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's, it's funny, isn't it? If, if you think of planning as a whole, everything that was done before the planning system, I'm sure, I don't know what the mechanisms were for the Victorians, etc. but they didn't build in the floodplain. Um, they, they responded, they built incredibly, incredible buildings with detail and, okay, they, they didn't understand the thermal performance or didn't need to at the time, but... Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd probably just get rid of the system. But, uh, <laughs> I'd get rid of politicians too as well. Um, you know, if, if businesses could run the city, I'm sure and there are sure mechanisms to do it, it would be do it more effectively. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. So yeah, we could privatise everything. So what, what's your plan for the rest of this year and what are you looking forward to in 2024? So what's left this year? I've got to try not to start a new business. That's, um, I've already got ideas, so... What are, what are some of the ideas that are Okay, well, no, one, so the artists in residence downstairs, that's becoming a, a basement parlour. Mm-hmm. So the bar's being extended downstairs. Make sure we're using the building to its fullest. With such demand on a Friday and Saturday, we just need that extra capacity in the bar. Yeah. So that, that will happen. That will get really... It will, it will be very exciting. I think it's just having those hard deadlines. As soon as there's a deadline, I can then work towards something when there's nothing concrete to work towards I could get a bit lost yeah so 24 it's a good question <laughs> <laughs> the thing is something will I invent something I don't know yeah Brilliant. I don't know I, I involve connecting people I'm sure <laughs> so I, well, I love it, it. I, I mean I, I love I love what you've done here and I love the kind of the ethos of it and it very much reflects your your personality and your ability to be able to communicate and and connect and build community. Thank you. And I love making as well. That's why if I can do something more, I'd make stuff, make more stuff. So yeah, and build the bars. Yeah. I'd love working with the builders or the, the electrician and and making it happen. Uh, yeah, perhaps we should more do that more. As, as architects, we should just get, go to site and make stuff. And, Love it. Brilliant. I think that's a perfect place for us to conclude. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you very much, Paul. And that's a wrap. And one more thing. If you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. Have you ever been frustrated with architectural photographers who aren't reliable or don't capture your projects the way that you'd hoped? Visit TobinDavies.com or BOAPhotos.com to book renowned architectural photographer Tobin Davies to photograph your next project. Tobin Davies travels to your location and specializes in architectural photography for modern design-focused architecture. Again, visit TobinDavies.com or BOAphotos.com to get more information or book your shoot today. And tell them you heard about him here on the podcast for a complimentary package upgrade. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond, or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.